floor is yours. Thanks, thanks for the introduction. So, two talks on pupilometry and I have a conflict of interest working with one of the two companies producing the pupilometry. So, what should we use this device? Um, you've heard several times during the meeting that we need to provide an adequate neurological examination to our patients for several good reasons. The best way to assess brain function, and when you look at the brain stem, I think that we rely a lot on the pupillar reflex, and probably we simplify it as uh, one marker of brain stem function alone. But probably pupillary uh, reflex and pupillar light reflex or pain reflex is much more complex and is uh, not only um, a technique that is able to evaluate the optic nerve function, to be after, for example, in optic and neuritis, but of course evaluate the brainstem, specifically here, but also the uh, balance or imbalance between the parasympathetic and sympathetic pathways, which is of course basically related to cortical function, to the autonomic system nerve function, and because there are connections within these pathways to the lateral geniculate nuclei to the visual cortex, it can potentially reflect the cortical function. So this is how it works. We have a system that is able to uh, provide a um, um, pupil light reflex, uh, a light stimulus to the pupils. It can record it, so it is autom automatized and it, is, it could be easily quantified. And you can see this on the video, you calculate the pupillary size of baseline, you have the percentage of pupillary light reflex, you can quantify the reflex, you can measure velocity, and you can also assess the latency. Uh, there are two systems, uh, one is coming from France, the other one coming from US. They are two not perfect, because they are not Italians, that's the point. Um, and there are some differences between the two. The main difference is that, for example, for this one, you can have an index that put together the four variables, the size, the constriction, the velocity. So it's a kind of index of the quality of popular right reflex, is the NPI, 0 to 5, 5 is normal, 0 is no reactivity, and below 3 is supposed to be abnormal. While the other system has been more developed in EOR, is able to use a pain stimulation into a pupillary dilation, so a kind of system that anesthesiologists have been used to evaluate the quality of analgesia during a surgical procedure. Now, are they the same? This is a paper just accepted yesterday on GNA from our group. We have compared the two systems, and you see that if you evaluate the size, the constriction, the velocity, there is, of course, a good correlation, not for latency, because the way the algorithm in the two systems that measure latency is totally different, but the three variables correlate well, but you see that in the blunt Altman analysis there is a difference, which means, in other words, there is no one is better than the other, but they are not interchangeable. If you use a cutoff from a device published in one study, you cannot apply the same cutoff, whatever is the indication, using the other device. So please, it's very important when you read the literature, you have to see which is the device that has been used. Now, if you want to see how we can use the clinical practice in the ICU, this is a very nice systematic review published on neurocritical care recently that has just reported the, I think, 32 studies where the pupillometry, the automated pupillometry has been applied in critical in patients. So if you want to read the entire literature, that's my recommendation. Very briefly, I think that we have to use it uh, just because we are unable with our, just, uh, with our eyes to evaluate properly the pupillary light reflex. This is a nice paper coming from France where basically they said that in most of the cases, doctors and nurses provide the same response is the pupil reactive to light than the pupillometry. But when the pupil size is less than 2 millimeters, which is quite common, especially in brain injured patients or patients who are sedated or analgesia, then you have some problems. It means that we underestimate and we consider these pupils to be non reactive while they are. And as sometimes we do CT scan or do some therapies according to pupil reflex, is of course very important. And even the evaluation of anisocoria. There is some errors. We can underestimate or overestimate the difference between the two pupils. And again, it's very important in clinical practice because some of our intervention, sometimes the decision to do an imaging can be relied on anisocoria. So we see that the, pupiler, the automated pupillometry is better than just our own clinical examination. Now, can we use it in patients with intracranial hypertension if there is a midline shift? 
you can have an alteration first of constriction velocities and then of course at the end of the procedure when there is a high, uh, the huge midline shift, you may have a pupillary dilation that we use in clinical practice, for example, to give money to, to some patients. Now there are some reports suggesting that you observe this reduction, early reduction of constriction velocities in patients that develop intracranial hypertension. The way that this uh, is changing according to the level of ICP is depending on the kind of region. So if you have a midline shift, ICD more than 20, you have a reduction of constriction velocity. If there is diffuse swelling, before the constriction velocity goes down, you need an ICP more than 30, again suggesting there is a difference in terms of pathophysiology. But using the NPI, which is the, this is again the pupillary, sorry, the constriction velocity is a, a case from Mauro, who was published last year in the book of the Congress. You see that the ICP goes up, constriction velocity goes down, and we do granectomy, the two, the two variables again, evaluate in opposite direction. But as I told you before, you can use an index, which is the NPI, that is a kind of global evaluation of the pupils. This is a report on five patients. And the idea is that this index can provide information on the evolution of ICP on the way that the brain tolerates changes of intracranial pressure. And these are data coming from Lausanne, so I have to thank Mauro, of course, for according me. Uh, this slide that is submitted uh, to critical care. And you see these patients with uh, traumatic brain injury, that when ICP goes up, the uh, NPI uh, follows the same and goes down. And in these patients, when you give some therapies to reduce ICP, what was interesting is that, again, the, NDP, the NPI um, uh, go to higher levels according to the reduction of ICP. And of course, because, because we're already interested in outcomes, uh, the burden of alteration of NPI, which means the duration of altered observation of this low NPI is correlated with those patients who have a refractory ICP, which means refractory to common therapies. Now, there might be other indications than just ICP. We'll hear in the next talk about the pronunciation of the cardiac arrest. There are some very small case series uh, in SIH patients when, again, they observe that the alteration of this index, the alteration of the quality of pupillary uh, reflex, precedes of some hours the clinical deterioration of patients with SH. Again, a physiological uh, signal that is earlier, that occurs earlier than um, the clinical examination. Uh, when you look at the cortical function, uh, we made a study here, which is submitted in Brussels, on the idea that, again, these analysis of the pupils can provide some information on the way that the brain is functioning. And uh, there are some reports in uh, um, papers that are made outside the SCU. In the SCU, it's complicated because there are auto confounders, sedation, uh, opioids in these patients. But we do just a proof of concept study where we have 60 patients on continuous EG, and they had a concomitant evaluation of this automated pupillometry. And what we have observed is that uh, with the neurologists that blindly uh, classify this EG as mild, moderate, severe, and encephalopathy or birth suppression. Of course, there is an overlap, it's not perfect, there are a lot of confounders, but you see that there is a progressive reduction of the pupillary constriction rate. And if you separate the, uh, the degree of encephalopathy in reactive, moderate to mild, on wrong non-reactive, which means severe encephalopathy or suppression, you see that there is a quite a nice differentiation between the two groups, in the area under the curve of the pupillary constriction to predict an unreactive EG was 0.83, which again doesn't mean that the pupillometry is a surrogate of EG, but if you don't, have a, you don't have a continuous EG and you are, for example, facing a medical patient and you have this kind of alteration, you might maybe want to do an EG to see whether it is reactive or not and then look for the causes. You could even use another situation. This is a study in post-operative patients in the ICU where basically the alteration of pupillary constriction could predict the development of delirium in these patients. And these are data from Lausanne, I again received from Mauro, when you can reproduce again a nice separation between patients who are mechanical ventilated, so this, this is not post-operative, and you see again, again with some overlap, which is true for all the techniques that we use, that there is an alteration in pupillary reflex constriction in patients with delirium when compared to others. Of course, you can do some other fancy things. You can look at the uh, autonomous nervous system. You can look at heart rate vari variability. It's something that is uh, behind my competencies. I cannot do this analysis. I have some software that you can use to calculate if there is an alteration of the ANS. What we have found in our departments, again, is proof of concept study. 
if you try to plot on this x y uh, graph um, one variable assessing the uh, ENS function and the deletion velocity, you see, it's not perfect, of course, just a proof of concept, there is some correlation. So probably there is some way we can apply this automated pupillometry and get more information than just the reflex to the light. We even look at the autoregulation, because autoregulation, as you heard from Gert, is a basically also a balance between sympathetic and parasympathetic activity, not at the level of the neurons, but the level of the vessels, and this is an ongoing trial. These are the data of 65 patients. I think we are now at 92 patients evaluated. And what we have observed is that in those patients who have an impaired autoregulation, defined as the MXA, as you heard from Gerd, transkinal Doppler blood pressure, there is more alteration in NPI. And you can see that there is, again, a linear correlation. The um, more is altered the autoregulation, the lowest is the NPI. These patients are basically not brain injury patients. These are medical patients. You can use also in the ORR, and these are studies coming from um, uh, anesthesiology field, where basically you can titrate the level of sedation in patients who receive surgical procedure. What I'm interested in, I'm aware of a paper from the Grenoble group, where they try to apply this concept, uh, still the, the reflex of the pupils to pain stimulation, in patients who are brain injured, where you cannot assess properly the level of analgesia. There are some visual scales that are not applicable in all these patients, while using the pupillometry you can quantify this degree of nociception. And I'm, let's say I have some information about the paper which is not online yet, that there is a nice correlation between this visual scale and again using pupillometry. So which means that in some patients who are on sedation paralysis, you can use the pupillometry even to quantify the level of analgesia. So trying to conclude and leaving tomorrow the um, uh, field of prognostication, I would say that in patients with a brain injury, probably the pupillometry can even replace our clinical assessment because it's more precise in terms of the assessment or reflex to the light, in terms of the assessment of anisocoria. We can probably insert or include pupillometry in a multimodal monitoring assessment in patients with brain edema to better understand the tolerance of the brain to elevation of ICP. It could be used to assess cortical function. We have some data, preliminary data, the association with the EG, maybe the association with the delirium, and it could be used, again, more for this research at that moment, as an indirect assessment of autonomic nervous system function. Thanks.